Are you tired of stinky socialists trying to take over America? And are you also tired of theorists talking about the free market as a cure-all for every problem with no first-hand experience of how the market actually works? Well, the Truth, Justice, American Way app gives you wall-to-wall shows by hosts who not only understand the market, but tell you how they make money in a variety of patriotic endeavors. The Truth, Justice, American Way app for Android is 24-7 streaming audio content on the topics of finance, liberty, self-defense, and technology. All the hosts are all American Americans from all over America. And the app is made in Wyoming, the cowboy state. Because you should buy American, even with free Android apps. Truth, Justice, American Way. Useful information, compelling personalities, and superior American audio quality. Go on the Google Play Store or the Amazon App Store and search Truth, Justice, American Way. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless America. And I just said, well, what if that is what I said? That's not even a threat. And I would never word a threat so badly if I were going to make a threat. And, you know, she called me. What do you think? You uncovered the great plot in Lufkin, Texas to assassinate the senator. (laughs) And like you just she happened to call me and I was too stupid to keep it to myself. We are just some modern day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery, statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 127th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a Pipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out you Uruguay. You can find out more about this at Pipcot.org. Hey, leave Uruguay alone. They're actually not that bad as far as states go. <laughs> They've got now some pretty- para Uruguay. That's another story. That's a completely, <laughs> that's a completely different story. They're but not so bad as far as cancer goes. U- Uruguay, <laughs> Uruguay. I think didn't they? I thought they decriminalized. They're just like the the, the, the tumor on the side of the arm, right? You can just get cut out, right? It's just like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I just I remember Uruguay because Derek Derek J would live there for a little while when I think right after he he met his uh, his boyfriend Stephen and uh, they were down there for a while and he kept talking about how much free like some things were horrible but a lot of things you were a lot freer down there so anyway yeah. uh, so we are back uh, I am Jeremy joined as always by Dave and Andre what's up guys hey what's going on man just right. loving life and this week we are brought to you by Discord because we have a special guest. Andre roped in somebody and dragged them in and said, you got to come on our podcast. Uh, so we have, we, have, we have Jessica Hughes here, who uh, Andre knows, I guess, from his writing group that he has talked about recently. Hi, that Jessica. That is correct. Hi, Jessica. Thanks Hi. for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, it's actually, it's, yeah, we, I, I like to get uh, females on the show every once in a while because, you know, there's always the jokes about in the libertarian and anarchist worlds that, well, it's, you know, it's, it's mostly true because the, ther- the stereotype is true. There's a lot more of us, you know, white boys uh, than there are anything else. So uh, it's always nice to have a, a female perspective being brought in. Uh, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Andre since uh, he knows you better. And why don't you start us off, Andre? <laughs> All right. No, not a problem. Uh, so Jessica and I are both members of a group called the Writer's Block. Uh, basically, it's a one-stop shop for improving whatever style of writing you do. We have a fiction workshop, a poetry workshop, workshop, and I am also heading up the nonfiction workshop. So if anybody wants... Oh, uh, that's... that's like yeah, I need to come down and uh, set up a shit post workshop? Uh, absolutely sure. not, Dave. But okay. you can, you can uh, submit your stuff to the nonfiction workshop. I mean, ship posting is definitely nonfiction, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, wait but a minute. No, they, about that. but uh, the purpose the purpose of all the workshops that we do there is uh, it's craft. It's to improve your writing craft, right? <laughs> and so, me and Jessica are there. Uh, Jessica is a phenomenal fiction writer, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to steal your spotlight, Jess. So you know, go ahead, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, I don't know about phenomenal, but thank you. Um, Definitely phenomenal. Well, I've 
I feel like I've gotten a lot better in the workshop um, in no small part due to Andre's very honest feedback. Um, there are a lot of great editors there and it's just really nice to be able to put stuff out in a community where people can be honest, but in a not obnoxious way. You know, we don't let anybody troll or anything, but um, it was just interesting to meet Andre there with such an obviously um, attractive screen name to me because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard when you're in places where politics is not the topic to really know what other people's opinions might be, but his is pretty obvious from the beginning. So that was nice. Straightforward and clear. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Completely. Those, you go by a Andre, Andre uh, over there, don't you, Andre? What's that? So do you go over by, by a narco Andre over there too? Is that what it is? Yes, oh, yeah. that's right. Yes, I do. <laughs> the first thing you, you learn about Andre is he, he basically just wears everything like a chip on his shoulder, just waiting for somebody to flip it off. So yeah, he doesn't hide. Hey man, he when, like when you're right, you're right. I mean, you know, what's, what's, yeah, what's when the, the truth is on your side, if you're like, correct. exactly. <laughs> well, it, it's refreshing and it's nice to be able to meet someone in a remote community like that where you're not really seeing people face to face or anything and, and really have it out there and obvious. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm kind of, I guess, like a, a baby in this. Um, I haven't really done like a whole lot of the in-depth writing and study that maybe a lot of my peers have. I have some friends who are in college and do not have like three kids and a full-time job who, <laughs> who have managed to be much more prolific in this. And so most of it on my end has been, you know, listening to podcasts. I spent a lot of time going through Mises University, um, their little online, um, oh, uh, for the iTunes um, oh, there's, library. I, I yes. listen to a lot of lectures from that. And I don't know, I just, I really enjoy it. And I know that probably sounds odd to some people, but most likely not here. So that's nice. <laughs> oh, no, you're, you're in good company here. We're all, yeah. uh, we're all on the same page. I've, yeah. Ish. I've, I've, I've done my, I've done my share of listening to and reading through the Mises Whip, you know, l doing both, you know, listening to the lectures and reading their stuff, you know, that comes, all the stuff that comes out of there. So, yeah. I should get paid for how many link throughs I get them. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we went on, y'all were talking about uh, For a New Liberty. That's one of the first things that I read and I just loved it. I still talk about it. I live in Pennsylvania now. Mm -hmm. And um, I will often bring up the alternative history of the Quakers and, and their refusal to be taxed or, mm -hmm. or to participate in taxing one another, um, refusal to go to war. You know, it's, it's just an interesting history to get from that perspective as opposed to the, you know, rah-rah that you get in public school. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, the Quakers. I'm, oh, I'm, well, so. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the Quakers. I actually... It's part. I, we, we, another thing I think we, I mentioned before we started the show, and it's been talked about a lot here uh, in the recent past year or so, actually now, uh, of me trying to get the hell out of New York and and relocate finally, and uh, I, I want to go into farming. And I was originally looking at, and still hopefully in the end going to get there, uh, somewhere in the western Pennsylvania, more likely into the southern eastern Ohio area, where there are a lot of the Amish and Mennonites and people like that. And I wanted to be near them specifically because of not only their their history of how, what they were back then, but how a lot of them still are today, <laughs> and uh, how they they just they still want to be left alone, and they don't want the government interfering and doing things. And uh, speci speci uh, specifically in Ohio, uh, the, those two groups actually do a lot to keep the agricultural laws at a bare minimum because every time somebody comes up with some cockamamie scheme for a new bill they're out and that's the one time they get political and they're out in mass and they're like nope 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 we don't want this done no no no, no this yeah. isn't happening and somehow those bills never get passed so yeah i'm a big fan of the quakers and all those people well we had uh i'm sorry we had no, some no. amish do our roof and you know they they will depending on the sect um these particular folks were willing to travel in cars, use power tools, but they can't own them. So I would go and pick up the guys that were working on our roof in the morning. And when it was over, I was so sad to not have anything. They are such peaceful, calm, centered people. I mean, it's very Zen, I guess. They just have so few um, 
distractions in their life, I guess. I mean, I know I'm not romanticizing it. I would not live that way. I couldn't. But it is really nice to be around them. Oh, yeah. And uh, well, there, I mean, there's there is something to be said about not, you know, relying on all the uh, all the gizmos and gadgets and flashy things of modern life and just getting back to good, decent living. I mean, you're you're absolutely cohesion, right. Cohesion, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that's a life that I could lead, or at least not to that degree. But uh, there is something to be said for it. Yeah. Well, I think if you're raised in it, you know, it's a little different. And I know they have like their room springer where they go and experience, you know, the outside world. But I could imagine, had I been raised in it, being very happy in that lifestyle. But to walk away from things like smartphones and computers and internet. and I mean, I think I just couldn't live without the ability to learn <laughs> that I have from the internet. I, I'm a yeah, knowledge junkie. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I, I, would have a, I, I would have a real issue with that, too. And uh, what, was, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah. The, and, and more specifically, going back to we were talking about the Quakers, I mean, we've our one of one of my favorite uh, guests we've had on the show twice now is uh, our friend the bad Quaker uh, Ben Stone, who uh, is one of the only actual remaining Quakers today that I that I actually know and uh, love <laughs> dearly. <laughs> um, but all all those types of people, yeah, they uh, it, it, it's interesting, like you said, because you don't you don't learn about a lot of this stuff in school. Obviously, you hear and then uh, you don't it doesn't get talked about. So it's up. It's definitely uh, nice to be immersed in that. Yeah, it really is. Well, I was not, um, I, I don't know how y'all, you know, came to these things, but I was not actually a very politically active person. Um, you know, even as an adult, uh, I had certain views and I, I don't know, I'm not a purist. So if y'all don't agree with me on everything, I'm not going to be upset about it. And I hope you'll feel the same about me, but uh, if, I, if we um, agreed I with consider- everything, I'd, I'd be worried. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense, right. purity spiraling. <laughs> Go on, Jess. Well, I, I guess mostly, you know, I'm a personally a rather conservative person in my own life, but I don't actually, you know, care what other people do or anything that's, you know, I'm against the drug war and things like that because I just don't think it's anyone's business. My my philosophy is, you know, just that I I own myself. I certainly have a greater claim to controlling myself than anyone else does. I come from the position that a group of people would have to show me a significant amount of evidence that they have a right to control me, and I've never seen anyone present that evidence. So as long as I'm not hurting other people, I feel like I should be left alone, and I feel the same about others. But I didn't really have a very clear view of that. I think it was kind of my personal feeling, but I never had any real background in it. And I wasn't interested in politics until um, 2008, and maybe not for the reason that some people are. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know that that was a very volatile experience for a lot of of voters, but for me, it started with a phone call from um, a campaigner for the Obama campaign, and I was in a terrible mood. My son, who was (laughs) nine... (laughs) <laughs> my son who was nine at the time had been hit in the head with a falling basketball hoop. Wow. And oh. we had spent, yeah, we had spent all day in the hospital with cat scans and everything. We had missed lunch. We were late to eat dinner and we're leaving. And this was at a time when I was still paying for minutes, you know, on my cell phone. And the call came from Texarkana, which is where my sister-in-law lived at the time. And I thought it was her checking on him. And when I answered it, this girl just said, you know, I'm calling from the Obama volunteers of Texarkana and we were just making sure we can count on your vote for the Senator in the November election. And I was, I was just in a mood and I am, you know, I'm not sure what kind of laws or anything, you know, would happen in an anarchist society regarding things like abortion. But for me, I think that there's no question that once a child's been aborted and separated from its mother, it's no longer like the mother has a right for it to be dead. And so the fact that Obama had voted repeatedly against an act that would have allowed those infants who were already born to receive the same life-saving measures as any other infant born prematurely, I mean, I just found that like beyond the pale. And I just hated his economics as well. So I said, 
I said, no, I won't be voting for him. I think your guy's a socialist. And he voted five times in the state Senate to let little babies die in hospital closets. So I'm not going to vote for him. And maybe you should think better of it. And I hung up on her. (laughs) Well, (laughs) 20 hours later, I mean, I only said it because it made me feel better at the time. I was just in a mood. 20 hours later, there are a couple of suits on my front porch. And I lived in Texas at the time. I mean, I had moved there because I thought Texas was all about freedom and, you know, let the government leave them alone. I mean, people will tell you it's the Lone Star State because we tell the government to leave us alone. Boy, that is such bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) It really is. It really, really Uh, is. It is. It is so fake and superficial. I mean, anyway, I thought I said... Micah, I think the Secret Service is here because I called Obama a socialist. And I couldn't, I, I mean, I was half joking, but I knew they were from the government the minute I saw them. Huh. And I opened the door and like, sure enough, it was this, um, a man and a woman. And the woman had this immediate attitude. They, you know, asked who I was. I confirmed who I was. They asked if I had taken a call the day before. I said I had. And then she says, and you told her that, uh, what was it? I will never vote for Obama and he will wind up dead on a hospital floor. And I I started to laugh. I started to laugh. And my husband, who is, we always joke that he's the great diffuser. He's very calm and very Southern comfort. He's really a great de-escalator and I am an escalator. And so. Oh, me too. (laughs) He starts saying, you know, no, I was in the car with her. That is not what she said. And I just said, well, what if that is what I said? That's not even a threat. And I would never word a threat so badly if I were going to make a threat. And, you know, she called me. What do you think? You uncovered the great plot in Lufkin, Texas to assassinate the senator. (laughs) And like you just she happened to call me and I was too stupid to keep it to myself. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) that's how inefficient government is, though. Like, they couldn't even. Uh, Yeah, it didn't even make any sense. They can't price anything correctly, so they have to view all these little stupid things as these. Because it keeps someone employed to go do some stuff. It's all just. We have to check all threats, no matter how, you know, no matter how credible. Right. Just Just in case. All right, yes. to, be, to be fair, if the government <laughs> was going to uncover a plot like that, that's exactly how it would happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> or my neighbor would turn me in or something. They certainly wouldn't figure it out on their own. Yeah. Well, you know, they, um, you know, they kept me on the porch for about 45 minutes. They um, asked me, you know, what I had said. I said, this is what I did say. And then they asked me, well, you know, how do you feel about the senator? I was like, wow. I'm not going to talk to you about that. I said, you know, I've told you what I actually said. You can record that and you can draw whatever conclusions from that you want. But I'm not going to stand on my porch in America and tell you about my thoughts and feelings so you can write it down in your little notebook. And they had this file with my name prominently displayed and it's like an inch thick. And I'm thinking, what in the world could even be in that file about me? I mean, I've had no. Well, if yours is an inch thick, I mean, (laughs) I don't even want to know what mine's. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, cases probably (laughs) because they have nothing else to do, I guess. And, you know, at some point um, he had said, you know, we're trying to, oh, I know what it was. I'm sorry. It's been so long. That's what it was. She said, she said something about, you know, she was accusing me and I said, look, just go to Texarkana because Texarkana is north of where I lived and they were out of the Houston office. So I thought, well, you know, maybe they stopped at my house on their way to Texarkana to interview this person and listen to the audio tape. I said, just go to Texarkana and listen to the tape and you'll know that I didn't say this. I don't know why you're wasting your time here. And she said, there is no tape. And I guess like I should have known that, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I think I was thinking, of course, there's got to be a tape. Like they think there's a tape of me saying this. Otherwise they would never be here. 
Mm -hmm. And I just lost it. I said, are you kidding me? There's no tape. So what you're telling me is you've come to my house and you're like threatening to question my neighbors and my family about me based on nothing but the word of a pissed off partisan. And she said, you have no evidence that she supports Obama. I said, she called me from the Obama campaign volunteers office. Like it does not take Sherlock Holmes to fill that, (laughs) figure that out. But now I see why you're working in Houston and not actually somewhere protecting somebody. And they didn't like that. And, you know, they said that they were, you know, we're trying to do you a favor. We could go. Oh, of course they are. Of course. Yeah, they said, well, we came to you first. We didn't go to all your neighbors and ask embarrassing questions about you. And that's when I was done. And I just said, you can go ask my neighbors any damn thing you want, but you're not going to stand on my porch and get any answers out of me. And that was it. We were done. I just went in the house and shut the door. But they were there for about 45 minutes. And it really bothered me in the aftermath because... I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems overly dramatic because they didn't like haul me off to a gulag or something. But it was the first time that I understood that in the country I grew up in where I was taught everyone was free and everyone was innocent until proven guilty, that that could have happened. And who would have stopped it? Because when I, when we were done, I called like the local FBI office. I said, you know, what is going on? What does this mean for me? And they told me that there would always be a record that this complaint had been lodged against me and um, that it could affect like my ability to get security clearances in the future and that the only way to get rid of it was to have it ordered expunged by a court. So I contacted my congressman and I contacted my state senator and everyone that I spoke to, my sheriff, everyone, it was somebody else's problem. Nobody had Uh jurisdiction. Of course. Nobody had any control over that. And I just thought, what if I had been taken? Like, you know, I mean, surely it wouldn't happen today, but five years from now or 10 years from now. And I will openly admit that at the time, I thought that this was like an Obama thing. I was like, oh my God, people are right. This guy is like crazy. Yeah, Um, I can see that. (laughs) <laughs> but very soon, very soon, I recognized that it was a government thing. And I think it was while we were, while Bush was still an incumbent and he bailed out all the banks and, and or the car companies and all of that, I, TARP, I just started reading voraciously. And it mm-hmm. started with history and then history became economics. And I became fascinated by how money was tied to just everything because you don't learn that. Unless it's to tell you that, like, rich people ruin everything. (laughs) Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. It's that 31%. Well, yeah. Those damn rich white people. It's all their fault. We've we've talked about it on here before. I mean, there's there's certain things that are specifically left out of every curriculum in the United States. And well, what, they have a narrative, dude. Well, yeah, but 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 actual economics and the history of money and what it actually, you know, all that type of stuff. Yeah, that's left out. Um, that's one of the biggies. And, and, <laughs> so and 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 the, and the double whammy is is that it's so economically inefficient. It sets so many people back. They're not getting real knowledge. They're not getting truth. They're not getting critical thought. They're getting literally garbage narrative shoved down their throat. And told to repeat it, or you don't pass. It's a joke. The whole thing. I if you have, have re- your kids in public state school schools right now, and you, it's child abuse. That's that's basically the only thing I can explain uh, it as. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you. I, I've I've made that. I've I've made that analogy before, and I don't. The more I think about it, I, I really don't like it because there are a lot of people that are in that situation, and they're they're doing it because they actually don't have a choice currently. So just to tell them that there are always know, a that choice, actually, man. No, there isn't, Dave. Unfortunately, because of because of exactly what you just described, because it's because so many people have been set back so far, and they're in positions later in life where they pretty much can't afford to believe me i've i'm somebody who who does this and and you know who who's who's unschooling my kids uh and i know how difficult like cuz i used to make those statements before i actually got to this point and now that i'm here i realize how difficult it really is <laughs> 
Well, not only that, but I mean, there's jurisdictions where there's laws on the books where you will go to jail if your kids are not in school, this is not true. in public school. Yeah. So I mean, it, th there are there are plenty of cases so, where there's you know yeah. your other option for not sending your kids. Well, to if you're not to going go to, to if you're not going to use any religious ex uh, exemptions, then you're going to have to deal with that. So right now there's an out. Again, Dave, I'm sure there won't not, be in the future, <laughs> but right yeah, now there is. Again, it's it's not it's not as easy as it sounds when you haven't actually experienced it. Believe me, I'm. I, I was. I thought a lot the same way you did until a couple of years ago. <laughs> until I reached this point, then it's like. Well, if it's not child uh, abuse, you need to be deprogramming and asking your kids every time they come home. What did your teachers tell you today? What did what? Let well, me read you your books, and and you don't have to and be like teach that. them if, that they they have to be looking at this stuff critically because not just because it comes from their teacher's mouth doesn't mean it's true. Just because well, yeah, the bell course, rings and and then you go to the next room is how life is going to be after that. It's all a farce. This is all just BS. Yes, and it's I, funny because there's a uh, there's a strong parallel to that with uh, law school in the 20th century with uh, you know teaching uh, generations of lawyers. But I'll leave that for another show. You know, we started unschooling, I guess, about six years ago. Um, our older, my oldest son went to an actual school, a charter school, for about six months, and it was so far behind where he was. He was so bored, out of his mind. And the kids were just, you know, it was just crap. And so we pulled him out. And none of my kids have ever been back to school. I have a, you know, my oldest just turned 18. And then I have a 15-year-old and a 10-year-old little girl. And none of them have been to school. But we've left it an open option for them. You know, there was some thought that the older ones might go to school just for, like, the high school experience. But... They didn't really want to, so they haven't. And um, Nick's like studying right now to just take his GED so that he can go to college next year. Um, and my youngest, I, I've, I've it been very open with her that, you know, if she wanted to go to school, we could do that. She's very shy, but she really wants to make friends. We've talked about maybe going to church or something, try to get her into like some clubs or what have you, but she's very um, self-critical, which is funny because we're not critical at all, but she's, she is very hard on herself about accomplishment. So she has trouble in a group environment where she feels like she's being judged for performance. Like when she was in dance class, she didn't enjoy it very much, but I think that there's a component of the child's choice as well. I, I don't think that it's, kind necessarily to keep them away from that if it is what they want if all the kids on their block are going and they really want to be part of that but it's important to be very involved as a parent so that their trust is not being given to their teacher you know if you're close with your children and they trust you and you're open and honest with them then I don't think you have a problem so much I mean my daughter is 10 and she she can spot hypocrisy or bullshit from a mile away. Like I can't even imagine putting her in a school because she would be in so much trouble probably because <laughs> yeah. she would just call the teacher on her bullshit immediately. It's like putting a feral cat in with a bunch of, you know, house trained cats. <laughs> right. Yeah, pretty much. Not to say that your your kid is a feral kid. That's uh, that was, yeah. I was gonna say my yeah. I was gonna say I, I wouldn't take that offensively if somebody said that about I, one. I, of my, I, I think uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Though. I mean, some it, days her hair. <laughs> no, but that that is an excellent point, and that's that's actually I was uh, when when Dave when you brought up that you know if 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 they're gonna go then you have to do this and you have to do that. It's like well no if 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 you do exactly what Jessica just said then you don't have to do all those other things. You don't have to like insist on reading their books and do all those other things. You just have to be, you have to have that trust. You have to build that trust with them. And then I, I of course hope my kids never decide they want to go to school, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you as far as, you know, giving them the option. Yeah. I mean, if that's what you want to do, how, how, how am I the person who's been raising you since, you know, since you were born to try to understand, you know, well, actually check that since they were about a year old, that's when I realized that they, that I was an anarchist. So lucky for them, I've had all these, you know, I've had all these wonderful thoughts and ideas, most of their <laughs> entire, you know, pretty much their entire cognizant life. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to preach, uh, self-ownership and this whole, this whole, all these ideas to them. So how can I rightly go ahead and say, well, no, you want to go to school? No, you can't do that. <laughs> 
Right. Well, and I think that children are natural anarchists, right? I mean, we all grow up with, I mean, there's a thirst for freedom and autonomy in all people. I mean, that's why slavery is abolished and, you know, people struggle against tyranny because we, we want to rule ourselves. And I think that if you, I think that you can beat that out of a child in a school, but if they have a trusted adult who is validating their feelings and their desires to be free and to be autonomous, then they won't lose that. Yeah. I think, you know, it's like you said, their, their kids are, are, are anarchists to begin with. And I'm actually going through that phase with uh, Kate right now. And I can see her desire to assert, you know, ownership of herself. She wants to do everything for herself. She doesn't want me to do things for her anymore. She wants to do them. She wants to make things happen. She wants to, you know, push the buttons on the microwave. She wants to heat up her own food. She wants to do her own hair. All of, you know, all of that together. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. How old is she? She is going to be turning four in December. Oh my wow. God. Of course, all that uh, age, <laughs> all that uh, motivated uh, self ownership is uh, can be a huge pain sometimes, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a wonderful thing to see. And that's the other thing I love about being a parent is like I get to watch a tiny human being learn first to manipulate their environment and manipulate their own bodies. You know, learning to walk, learning to talk, learning to have fine motor control, and yeah. then I get to watch them develop cognitive skills. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever witnessed in my entire life. I don't like that. I don't even think going to space would be as wondrous as watching <laughs> Kate learn and grow into a human being, like a full-fledged human being. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, man. I've, uh, you know, my, my my girls are just a couple, uh, you know, a couple years ahead of yours, and yeah, it's it's, it's crazy to, to just to watch that. I try to. I have to. I have to remind myself, even when I was super busy all the time, that every once in a while, I have to at least just sit there and watch them. And uh, I actually, you know, speaking of the whole independent thing and stuff like that, I was, you know, when you when you were rattling off the things that that she does, that she wants to do on her own, I was like, wow, at six, my kids don't even want to do half that stuff. Um, but they they do have they they do they are fiercely independent on other things, where that you know obviously they they want to. Uh, have their you know their control that control the situation and i i have that extra dynamic of watch not only watching them do that you know do that but uh you know because i have the twins so i get to watch them play off of each other and then watch two very strikingly similar looking human beings <laughs> do two completely different things in one situation and then do almost the exact same thing in another situation sometimes when they're not even in the same room uh which is really freaky but uh but yeah it's great but yeah because they uh, they're they're in this phase now when they're here with me that they a lot of times they get into their play mode and uh if i ask them if i can join them they tell me no <laughs> because they're doing something <laughs> and then that's when i take that opportunity i just sit and watch because it is, it's fascinating to watch them, you know, to to learn all that stuff and then continue. And then once they get a little older and once, you know, when their imagination starts running wild and they start doing all these other crazy things and yeah, it's, it's, it's great, man. It's literally, it's watching praxeology in action because it's what, you know, I, I can imagine with two daughters, you can watch them play off each other and like come up with different ways to interact with each other and incentivize certain behavior that they like, I, I can't imagine how unbelievably awesome that is. Yeah, it's, it's Co great. coincidentally, if my daughter was a little bit taller, she would probably do the laundry by herself just to do the laundry because <laughs> she watches me and her mom do it. So like she would she just would want to do it just to do it just to show us that she can. That's awesome, though. That really is. Hopefully that continues, you know, throughout her life. And when she's a young adult living on her own, she doesn't just like let her apartment go to shit. I hope I'm praying because <laughs> that's what I did. Well, you know, a, a lot of for me, it's it's weird because I didn't start to unschool until the boys were like nine and twelve, and um, in all honesty, I was I was so afraid of the direction that things were going. I mean, I had given up any semblance of physical punishment like long, long ago, years before that, but I was still so controlling. Like I wanted them. 
and not because I wanted to like live vicariously through them or anything. I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. Like I genuinely loved them, but so much of my parenting was born out of fear for what would happen if I didn't do the right things. And, you know, my husband and I decided to give it like a six month experimental period. And I was so shocked when I stopped trying to control them and make them do things like keep their room clean or study or learn things. I was so surprised by how much they bloomed and learned on their own and, and how much closer we became as a family. Um, I don't think that if I had stayed, you know, working the way that I had been, um, that we would have the relationships that we do today. And I don't have to, you know, like my oldest is very good. They're actually all really good about helping around the house and things like that. But I don't worry at all anymore. Like I know that they're motivated to accomplish things. And so for example, my middle son, he just had us open him a savings account because he learned to code on Roblox and he's been accepting payment for coding and he's got like, that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got like $1,500 he needs to cash out. And I'm like, Oh wow. Good for him. That? Nice. Yeah. And nobody ever told him like, oh, well, you like playing that game? You should make money doing that. He just, you know, he's done that on his own. And he actually. Well, how is he going to do that without Algebra 2 under his know. Bill, you know? <laughs> right. You mean he didn't take Western Civ? That's unacceptable. <laughs> actually, we did do a Western Civ <laughs> class together. <laughs> we were still doing school school, but. Um, years ago, I bought him a klutz book. I don't know if any of the other parents are familiar with these. They're just like books that'll teach you some silly crafty kind of skill. And I bought him one that taught you to make balloon animals. And he was, gosh, I'm trying to think, I guess he was like 11 when we were living in Boise and he called the IHOP and got permission to do balloon animals in their vestibule on Sunday mornings when it was backed up. And he would just stand in there with a hat and make balloon animals. And probably the greatest experience my kid ever had That's was awesome. like, you know, as far as educationally, this older gentleman came up to him and said, whose idea was this son? And Joe said, mine. He said, you learned to do this on your own. Joe says, yeah. He says, you come and do this every Sunday. He's like, yeah. The guy gave him a $20 tip and said, you're going to be a millionaire someday. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he is, he's so driven to do things, you know, he's, he's very driven and, and, but he's happy with what he's doing. And there was, we were talking earlier about like, well, you'll have to make sure that they don't learn this or that. And, and I get that feeling because when I first started to unschool, I understood that there is a certain level of involvement in our society that is looking for a cog and I thought can am I really doing the right thing to teach my children to be so unwilling to be a cog if that's what they need sometimes you have to put food on the table and you have to do that so you know the conclusion I came to was that if my children are educated properly and and are you know, raised in a way where we're honest with them about realities and responsibilities and things like that, you know, an intelligent person can always fit the bill as a cog for as long as they need to, but at least they won't be doomed to only being a cog. And I feel like that decision has, has borne out really well for, for our family. Well, and that goes back to what, you know, you were saying about giving them the the choice if they want to go to you know, a traditional like a public school or a private school if they want to stay in that environment or not. Because making them go there and presenting it as their only option does necessarily force them into that cog sort of space to where they don't feel like they have any other options. Right. So, and options I mean, are important. Oh, yeah. That's that's what the spice of life is, options. Absolutely. Well, and I compare it to the military. So you were in the military. I day, certainly so, was. So you know Statist. how it is, right? Like, like if you're smart enough to understand it's a game, you can get along just fine because you play and you know that all the shit they're saying to you and all of the yelling and the spitting and the screaming and the demeaning is just part of the game. And if you're like really, really dumb, 
you don't know any better and you accept it and you do fine. It's like the people in the middle that don't do well. And, you know, that's how I look at my kids. My kids are smart enough. They're, they're intelligent enough to play the game if they need to, but hopefully they won't need to. Well, and the other, the corollary to that is uh, if you're smart enough to know it's a game, but you hate playing the game, yeah, you're going to have problems. <laughs> but uh, that's that's why I'm glad you're giving them the option. I hope I, I have the opportunity to do that with Kate. Because, uh, I mean, by the time I'm going to be out of law school, it's going to be coming up to where she's going to get ready to start, you know, primary school. So hopefully I will have the chance. I don't know. I don't know if I could just, you know, go full on unschool or homeschool or, you know, what the deal is, but uh, I, I will hope to be able to present her that option as well. Well, who was it that was saying they were thinking about moving to Pennsylvania? If you have children and you want to unschool or homeschool, don't come here. Oh no, I, I know that's yeah, no, that's why I was saying oh. I was I was actually going to Ohio originally, and then I yeah. then I found out that Indiana's unfortunate. Well, while while unfortunately bad on other things, is actually even better on on unschooling. It's actually one of the best best states in the country. Because they, they they pretty much have the attitude that I've been looking for, which is, oh, those are your children. Oh, you don't want to bring them to our schools. All right, good luck with that. See you later. And <laughs> there's like no check ins. You don't have to have you know evaluators come and all that stuff, which is the situation I'm looking for with my kids. Because I, I, you know, you're talking about playing the game when you have to and stuff like that. I'm doing my damnedest to try to avoid that. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and because I currently have the well, because I currently have the option to uh, relocate. Well, it's to 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 do it right now while they're at this age, you know. And I have a couple. Of, I have I have nothing set in stone yet. So there's there's multiple options. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to nail that down, <laughs> so I don't have to deal with the, the you know having to play the game if it comes to that. Because that yeah that re yeah I realize I know Pennsylvania is although it is bad. Sadly, it's not as bad as where I currently am in New York, where it's absolutely horrible. <laughs> See, when yeah. I started, I was in New Jersey, and they didn't have any kind of requirements at all. Well, I, I know our our former co-host, uh, Danilo, uh, actually relocated his family from New York. He actually used to live out here on Long Island with me, and then he moved upstate. And because of the, the problems with dealing with the uh, dealing with the state as far as his children went and trying to homeschool them, he, him and his family ended up picking up and moving to New Jersey, which unfortunately is just as bad or even worse on a lot of other things. Right. Yeah. Uh, homeschooling is the one thing they seem to leave everybody alone about, which is nice. I'll tell you the best place I ever was for like community. And um, so I started out in New Jersey, but then I moved to Texas when my kids were 18 months and like four years old. And Texas had a very large homeschooling community, but it was also very religious. And although I am a Christian myself, I don't feel like educating my children in that way. I feel like I came to this decision as an adult. It's my choice. I want it to be their choice. And everyone would just be so up your ass about like, are you using a Becca? Are you, what are you doing with this? And it, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> Then we moved to Colorado and we lived about 20 miles west of Steamboat Springs in Hayden. And it was phenomenal. Steamboat Springs had the most accepting, non-intrusive, but incredibly active homeschooling community I've ever seen. They were fantastic. And Colorado was a really nice place to live. I mean, where we were was extremely expensive. We could not live there. Um, anymore, that's for sure. But again, I'm coming from New York, so that everything's relative. Yeah, <laughs> probably <laughs> not, right? <laughs> no, no. I'm just, there are parts I know, and but although Col Colorado, from everything I've seen, I've never actually been there. It's beautiful. <laughs> I, I do have friends that live out there, but yeah, it's uh, seems like a nice place. I've found that. I mean, I, I know, like nobody likes taxes, and I personally think they're theft. But of all the places I've ever lived, I'm telling you, like the. Colorado and the Northwest are the only places I've ever lived where I felt like our taxes went to anything that was like genuinely good for like the family and community. They always had all kinds of classes available and stuff. And I'm not saying that if I had the choice, I would say, yes, keep taxing people for this. But if they're going to take the money, at least it was at least nice to have good. that. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it was really nice. Art classes for all different ages, sports, all you know, just so many different things that anyone could join in on. And they had like a robotics um, class and everything, programming. It was really fantastic there. I would love nothing more than for my daughter to become really interested in programming. Number one, it would make her grandparents like just the proudest grandparents in the world because my, you know, my <laughs> parents wanted me to get into computer programming, the same thing that they were doing, and you know, because it's the, you know, it's still a way to live. It's a good, solid living. You know, there's tons of stuff you can do, and uh, you know, number one, it would make them like super happy. But number two, it's, there's, it's really, it's a great way to make a living. It is. You can do it when you're 15. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is this is no that's no overhead, true. no middle <laughs> management, no nothing. You can just sit in your room and make stuff. Bam, done. Easy, simple. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm with you, man. I'm gonna try to encourage my girls too because it's you funny. You can learn everything on YouTube. We're, we're, yeah, I know. I, I what know, a time well, to be alive. Well, because it's funny when when coding got brought up earlier, I was like, I was like, man, another person, you know, younger than me who's already doing it. Because um, <laughs> I, I tried picking it up recently, <laughs> and uh, trust me, I know exactly how I, you feel. I, I, got, I tried that boat and I totally missed it earlier in my life. Yeah, I, I did too. But it's it's never too late because there there's wonderful things like you know even even like coding academy you can pick up a bunch of stuff off of that uh, website you know there's a bunch of free you know free th- testing stuff you can do and uh, there's other sites like that too so it's, it's never too late i would just you know i was uh, lamenting because i i don't you know haven't gotten off my rear end and actually done anything about it because i started doing that i don't know six months ago and then i got distracted by well life and uh just never got back to it but yeah i'm, I'm with you i'm gonna i'm gonna try to introduce my kid my, my kids actually haven't uh, really shown an interest in computers or anything beyond being able to watch things on them yet. That's right. So um, uh, I haven't really pushed it, but w- once they do, I'm definitely going to start <laughs> introducing them to this stuff. And and hopefully by then I will have gotten a, a little more of a solid foundation into myself. And then I can actually show them and say, hey, you know, if this is something you're into, run with it. If not, okay, you know, whatever. Maybe maybe once I'm a practicing lawyer and Dave has me on retainer, I'll spend some time uh, learning how to code. A coding lawyer can't be a bad combo. Yeah. No, no. I'm going to be a renaissance man. I mean, I already got like all of the philosophy, ethics, economics, history, all that stuff. That's already solidly in my corner. Now I'm going to have law. And then I just need a technology to kind of round it out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of getting that stuff out there. Like I said, it's, it's never too late for anybody. You can always pick this stuff up, and yeah, it's, you know, like I said, for me, I, you know, we, we I was mentioning earlier that it's not as easy to do this necessarily as some people like Dave were trying to make it out to be earlier. You know, if you have to, if you have to be in a situation where they, where, you know, you have to play the game essentially and the kids have to go to school, you know, you have to do that. I'm just, I, I'm in a very, although there's a lot of things for me are currently up in the air. Uh, I do, I am in a very fortunate position, at least for my kids, you know, kind of the same way that I, figured out the whole anarchism thing just as they were turning one and also at the same time ran into Stefan Molyneux and the whole uh you know not spanking thing and uh quickly changed my mind before I was able to do any damage so that was a fortunate thing and the same thing here it's like okay they're just about getting to, they're at the age now where they're supposed to be in school we've been unschooling them anyway for a couple of years but now right before I have to actually deal with the state of New York coming in here and starting harassing us on a regular basis because they're not in school and we haven't, you know, registered them with the state because, well, I haven't even registered my dog. Why am I going to register my kids? Uh, you know, <laughs> well, uh, clearly your your dog is is less important than your children are. So, you know. <laughs> so I'm not going to, um, you know, I, I, I have the opportunity now to go somewhere and uh, hopefully land where it will be very beyond unintrusive just like you know kind of yeah leave you alone do what you got to do take care of them and then uh as we as we mentioned earlier as they get a little older if if it's something you know if actually going to a school is something that they want to do then we'll talk about it and uh you know if they really want to do it then who am i to stop them but hopefully if i've laid the correct foundation (laughs) quote unquote correct foundation that won't even be an issue when it comes to it because hopefully they'll be doing a lot of the things that you're, we've already talked about with with your kids. You know that that's that's what drew me to unschooling originally. The fir- it was the, fr- the first time that I heard Dana Martin speak, 
and she was talking about her children and how she had, uh, you know, the uh, what did she have five, five kids, I think, four or five, I can't remember. But her kids, you know, she was talking about like nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds who had already had multiple businesses and were currently running ones that were successful, you know, and whatever they were doing. And it's just like, it was, it just opened up this whole new world to me because I had already got on the homeschooling thing and I hadn't even considered like, you know, the thought of going beyond that hadn't even struck me. <laughs> and when I heard all that, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, you know, you always talk about, oh, what if, what if I had the knowledge that I had now back then and all those type of things, you know, talk about any one thing you could bring back. Yeah. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> That's the one thing yes. I wish I could impart. You know, I saw somebody yeah, post, hell yes. posting that earlier, you know, one of those questions, you know, what would you tell your like 17 year old self or your 15 year old self or, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's the one thing I would say. <laughs> Just entrepreneurship. Look into it. <laughs> also oh, buy Bitcoin. Absolutely. Well, oh, yeah, my goodness. obviously, but. You know, <laughs> even you said that even minus the even sorry, just even minus the Bitcoin thing, telling them to look into entrepreneurship will still uh, you know would still end them in the same place, uh, even if for some reason Bitcoin ha- didn't happen in that reality. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny that you brought up Molyneux as you know uh, how he brought that change about, but. I actually, um, you know, like I said, we had not used like corporal punishment in years and years and years, but. Uh, I guess it was in 2000, I think it was 2013. Oh my God, I'm getting so old. I <laughs> gave a, I gave a lecture at um, SFA uh, on the constitution and its illegitimacy kind of based on Spooner and my husband so cleverly named it the constitution of faux authority. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, um, Very nice. And actually, um, Stefan Molyneux was there and he gave a talk as well. And one of the people had asked him about, you know, I guess there's like a big disconnect in the libertarian community. Like some people see themselves as owning their children and they can do whatever they want to their kids until they're a certain age, whatever. Um, And he gave this example and, and I don't agree with Stefan on everything, but this really did change my life and my kids' lives. He talked about seeing your children as almost a hostage, that they didn't ask to be brought into the world. They don't get to choose you. And just looking at my children from that perspective just changed everything for us, you know, being able to look and say, you know, that, that, well, no, they don't owe me taking out the trash just because I put food in their belly. I made that belly. <laughs> exactly. I better feed yeah, it, you, you, you know? owe them food for them right. being there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And strangely, when we stopped asking for those things in that way, like as if they owed us something, I mean, they're so much more joyfully willing to help with so many things when you ask. It's it's a real difference. Oh, Yeah. What, and it's it's amazing to me because really when you break it down and you think about it, and a lot of people tend not to to go down that rabbit hole because they don't want to get involved with oh well you know when do when do children start having rights as human beings yada yada whatever. So a lot of them just kind of stop and be like oh well you know parents own their kids, plain and simple because you know reasons. But uh, no, you're you're absolutely right, and he was absolutely right. Your act of bringing them into this world imparted upon you a positive obligation to take care of them because thanks yeah. to you they're in a state of incapacity they can't take care of themselves and so you hear have, it was. Yeah, exactly you have the responsibility you you as a parent in your unique relationship with your child have the responsibility to care for them and to make sure that they are well and that they are healthy and that they are you know going to grow into moral agents absolutely yeah and I, I, I agree with you. I, I would say that childhood and like, you know, where life begins, there's such hard things to argue because there really are no parallels. You can make up, you know, so many different metaphors, but they, none of them are a hundred percent the same. It, they really are very unique situations in all of the world and all of human experience. But I guess for me, what it came down to, and and unschooling helped a lot with this. I I read Sandra Dodd's blog, and I belong to her unschooling group, and she's very hardcore and unforgiving. But I think that I needed that a lot because there were so many things that I was doing wrong, and 
And um, I'm glad that someone out there cared more about the way I treat my children than how they made me feel. <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. A lot of people find her too harsh, and, and I understand that, but it was what I needed. Um, but a big part of it for me was just you know, maybe even if I don't have a positive obligation morally for that, if my goal is to love my children and to make them feel loved, then that is what I should do. And I started making the choice every day that it was more important to me that my children feel loved in this moment and that there be more happiness in our home in this moment than that a bed be made or dishes be taken out of the living room when you're done with them. And when everyone was happier and more calm and felt better, you know, all of those things sort of took care of themselves because they wanted to be good to us in return. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that. That's, that's great. And that's, you know, it's, it's a good reminder for me because some, sometimes I, I forget about that, but everything you guys, both of you guys were talking about, I mean, obviously I, I agree with because uh, I I had heard the you know you were mentioning that you heard that via uh, a speech that Molly you gave and I, I had heard some of those things from him too but I I had the problem originally when I ran into Rothbard and the whole eviction argument because that was where I was just like well wait a minute no 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 you do have a positive there are positive obligations in this world you know Andre you hit it you know you, you use that phrase that's exactly what it is yeah you created a positive obligation by making the kid yo uh, you got to do something about it. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's just like anything else. Anytime, it can, I don't know how many times, like, oh, there's no such thing as positive obligations. I'm like, of course there are. What the hell do you call a contract? I mean, yeah. it, it, I, there's there's clearly examples of this, so I don't understand how this is a foreign concept. And if you take a look at, you know, what what, what, the, what the situation is between a parent and a child, I mean, I don't see how there could possibly be any other way to interpret it other than you have a positive obligation to your child. Without you, your child dies. Like without you or a caregiver, your child perishes. And without you having brought the child into the world, this wouldn't be an issue. So, I mean, I don't understand how somebody could argue against that. But I mean, even setting that aside, you know, as a parent, what do you want for your kids? I mean, as as people who don't believe in, you know, as us who don't believe in, you know, coercion and violence and aggression or well, coercion and aggression. I mean, what do we want for our kids? We, we obviously don't believe that coercion and aggression are good things. They're obviously evil things. So why, why would you set an example where this is you know, perfectly okay to use, in, like you said, just the unique and very special relationship parents have with their children? Yeah, and I think that a lot of libertarians or anarchists who like to focus on the eviction argument and claim that there's no positive obligation and... You know, I think that what they want to focus on is like, well, you know, how would you punish women for doing this? How would you punish parents? How would you monitor it? And that's not what it's about. You know, I don't have to tell you exactly how a world of anarchy will work in any other way for you to admit that, you know, a lack of coercion is the correct way to live. And I shouldn't have to tell you, ex you know, maybe there will be no punishment, but does that make it right? I mean, plenty yeah, of things of go unpunished that are wrong. And I think that for those of us who are saying we should have a world without coercion, without this kind of police state where they're, you know, peeking into everybody's, you know, emails and making sure, then we do have an obligation if we want to see a world like that come about. To raise it's going to take generations. generations. Yeah, to raise generations of people who are loved and whole and kind and generous and merciful. And people only learn those things when they're shown them. You know, it's like I've said on other topics, you know, when that conversation comes, you know, all of these arguments, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, well, how can you, how can you force, you know, women to, to carry babies to term? And, you know, why are you punishing parents, yada, yada, whatever? I'm like, okay. So let's set that aside for a second. Your beliefs are that coercion and aggression are wrong. So are you going to take the position that it's okay if other people do it? Or are you going to take the position that this is not the way things are supposed to be done, period? And that this is not behavior that you approve of? 
And that's really what it boils down to is like, how do you want to look at the world? Do you want to be permissive and accepting of behavior that you, to you, according to your beliefs, your stated demonstrated beliefs is absolutely positively wrong, the absolute wrong way to go about things? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to say, no, this is not right. And I'm going to say that it's not right. Plain and simple. If you don't, if you're not going to stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And I, I say, stand with Liberty, stand with freedom and stand with, family and stand with these ideas that make sense and not these ideas that don't make any sense at all you know like when you really look at them these people have these half examined ideas in their head and then an idea like libertarianism comes along and it's like what in the hell is this why does this make so much sense why does everything else make no sense this can't be right and then you look further into it you're like holy crap Everything it's is a, messed up. It is amazing how intuitive it is because that's tumbled into it because I started with, oh, okay, well, you know, the federal government shouldn't be, you know, imposing on the states. You know, there's, you know, dual sovereignty here, right? And after that, it all just kind of like, I kind of just went down the rabbit hole and kept on going. And every time I would reach something that like really surprised me, it took, you know, I took a second to think, I was like, that really makes sense. What else does this mean? And it just right. kept on going. It's amazing <laughs> how utterly intuitive all of this stuff is. Yeah, if you can't justify the federal government, then you really can't justify the state governments and you can't, I mean, if you justify, you know, any kind of involuntary government structure, then you really lose any ability to argue against a one world government, you know, and that's what it Bingo. is. Bingo. Yes, don't exactly. Stop. They, they one stop. state, one nation right. ruling over <laughs> everything. And that's that's the opposite of what needs to happen. There needs to be a billion nations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seven billion sovereigns, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm there. Yes. <laughs> well, and you know, talking about like parenting and liberty and stuff, you know, I've talked with a, a friend of mine about how, you know, when he gets really down and feels like everything's going in the wrong direction, I remind him how many people are raising their kids this way. And I have this theory that, you know, when you raise your kids and, you know, you try to impose a certain kind of political belief, like say, you know, the, the joke is that like very conservative people raise like hippie kids and vice versa, you know, family ties, whatever. But I think that it's probably because I think that that's probably true to some extent because children are hypocrisy detectors and they've got, you know, say these parents who have their Obama sticker and they're all about peace and all this stuff. And then Obama's dropping bombs all over the middle East and you know, they're hypocrites. Two and, plus two, this doesn't add up. Right. What you're saying. And you know, you've got the kids with the Republican parents who are all about small government, small government until it comes to like whether gay people should be allowed to get married. Then suddenly they need a constitutional amendment and they see <laughs> that hypocrisy but there is no hypocrisy in embracing freedom. And like, you know, we were talking earlier, like children are natural anarchists. They're naturally desirous to be free. And so I really believe that if that, that will exponentially increase those generations. Yeah. Well, well the, the fifth turning us, is right? uh, about, <laughs> it is, it is coming. Do you guys, are you guys familiar with the, the generational theory, the, the five, mm -mm. Uh, well, basically every there's a fifth turning that happens in the last uh, generation on this every five generations is like super duper duper conservative. And then because they're super duper conservative, the next four generations can basically live off of their successes because of the abundance that they've uh, you know supplied and created. Uh, that they tear it all down and that decay is what causes that fifth turning is people go, wait, we can't do it like all these people, these last four or five generations go, we got to try new system. And it, and that's what it basically happens. We're, we're, we, us in this room, we were born on the fourth turning and the fifth turning is, is about, it is coming is what I'm trying to say here. It's, it's, it's what it's, our kids are going to be. Yes, basically one hope they, they're the generation that's going to basically be, you know, <laughs> doing the, 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 the gun blazing. We're the talkers <laughs> they're, they're, they're Here's what's going to happen. They're going to, they're going to be saying, uh, the great thinkers like 
anarcho laundry and you know blah 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 you know it's <laughs> and we're gonna be sitting around like oh we were idiots these guys why are they listening to us you know so. <laughs> but i mean we have to do we have to keep pushing and generational generation generation we're going to keep there's going to be a more freedom net freedom if everyone's pushing for it and it starts with your kids and the next generation yeah what that, a, almost everything else is inconsequential one of the first posts i ever made on steam it was uh explaining why i i came to anarchy from being you know a, a hardcore republican and before that like a hardcore national socialist and it really boils down to like I, I hate to say it, but it's it's all it's it's me thinking about the children. Um, it's you look at the world. We're tribal by nature. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I look at the world around me. I'm like, God, this this is terrible. I want this to be so much better. Now, granted, I don't think I'm going to see. You know, I I might see a little bit improvement in my lifetime, but what really matters is, you know, what does my daughter inherit? What do her kids inherit? What do what do their kids in? What are what kind of world are my great grandchildren gonna live in? I, low time preferences, man. It's all about low time preferences and expanded time. Indeed. Horizons. Yes. <laughs> well, it's as as technology increase. Here's the, the the worst part about it, right? Because we're in the fourth turning, we're 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 in the uh, the excess, the apathy generation, you know. Because we're in that, we have all of these technological advances that the the ones didn't have before it, but we still have all of their successes to play with. So you have a lot of people that literally just live off of, of a farce. They have no income. They have nothing. They basically just live on credit. And that's going away as well. Like the kids don't get credit cards. They refuse yeah, them. This is true. This is true. They're like, this is obviously stupid. Like, why would you do this? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, when you have a, a tell entire- me about it. <laughs> when you have an entire consumer base that only buys what they absolutely need or can afford, you know, either one, that they're the market is going to completely change. The way everyone lives is going to change because everyone has to react to that generation. Hopefully, and I say this sincerely, hopefully it doesn't require something like the uh, privation of the 30s or the the thirties to force mm. the world to become like that. I really, I really hope that our generation, our kids, whatever that it takes and start to going end, down that road before things get as bad as they're going to get. Whatever it takes to end the fed and then the inevitable, like global fed that they're going to try to put in because the fed collapsed, whatever it takes to stop both of those, bam, bam. So it's going to be like a double whammy. Uh, whatever it takes to stop those is going to be what it takes. And until there's well, a no, 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 I, I, told, I totally that, agree. I just hope there. I just hope that uh, they're going to start making preparations and start adjusting their behavior, and you know, living more frugally and making better, you know, monetary and economic decisions for their personal lives and for the lives of the people around them before that happens, because they'll have a leg up on everybody else. They won't be like, oh yeah, you know, dying and starving like I probably will be. <laughs> the world's going to be so different for people who expect a handout and versus people that go and get it. And then in the near future, because of the ability to directly connect to consumers and sell yourself instead of a product, most people don't really care about products. They want to say, I got this, you know, blah, blah, blah from that brand. guy. You know, yeah, it's about brand. Yeah. yeah. So it's the product is inconsequential. And we're I mean, moving it's a little to consequential. a it is like you have to have good stuff. You have well, to have a sellable was, product. Well, I was but gonna, I was we're say. moving to a social capital world more than a uh, capital capital world uh, under this federal bloated print all the money in the world system. We're moving to a more social capital, and I don't know where we're gonna. Li- I don't, I think the next currency is also going to be tied in with social capital, like in some way. It's it's going to be democratized some way, I unless it's they're for forced, unless it's that forced Fed coin or whatever that comes out. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait Good for social ripple. capital capital to be the source of your you know standing economically because I've always held that you know in a stateless society, reputation is king. Reputation is what you have to bank on. Yeah, a reputation nobody, based currency would be nice. Yeah, because <laughs> if nobody wants to do business with you. It doesn't matter how good your product is that you want to sell. No one's yeah. going to buy it because they're not going to buy it from you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, yeah. You can't force people to buy stuff from you and, and without going full blown statist. So <laughs> that's <laughs> that you then create a state once you start forcing people to buy from you. And that's essentially what our next generations and what we have to focus on attending to is destroying this idea that we all need this big centralized thing to take care of these silly things that can be done by the market. And until people stand up, it's going to stay the same. And all we got is people like Jessica, Andre, and Je uh, Jeremy who are pumping out kids and <laughs> learning them right. It might be done right? pumping, but uh, yeah. Pumping kids out and learning them right. You got to get that done. Well, yeah. I have every intention of a child. <laughs> We're going to retake Constantinople. Excellent. Oh, gosh. Uh, on that, I note, ran out of steam. <laughs> yeah, on, on that note, I, 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 we should probably get wrapping up because we 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 we're like an added hour ten now, I think. So, but uh, this has been uh, this has been a great conversation. So, first of all, Jessica, thank you so much for uh, coming on tonight. This is a, this has been great, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, sharing everything you did did because it. Uh, we, it, this is, these are topics that we've we've talked about on the show before, but it's been quite a quite a long time, and it's it's great to get an, another you know a, a, another take on this, because uh, you know as as we've been saying, this kind of, this kind of stuff is important, and uh, giving our children the opportunity to learn these things and not and not force it on them, you know, just kind of present them with certain things at an earlier age than all of us were given the opportunity to, to learn about them and then see where they go with it. And then, you know, like you said, you were, Jessica, you were saying with your kids, you know, they, they kind of, they kind of figure it out. <laughs> they, you set the example and you, and you, and, and you don't push it. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I want to help. Hey, I want to be, I want to do this. Hey, look at this. Now, now look what I'm doing at this age. It's, it, you know, so, and that's, that's all we can really do. So, so thank you very, very much. And uh, I'll let you say anything you want to say in closing before we get out of here. Oh, well, yeah. You know, you just made me think of, you know, the one thing that I would tell parents, like the, the biggest issue that I think, you know, American parenting suffers from is this belief. I think it's almost a puritanical streak, that belief in original sin, that if you let your kids, they will be just evil that they start out bad and you've got to train that out of them because everyone believes that the least bad example will be followed by a child. If they watch a show with sex in it, they're going to be sluts. If they, <laughs> you know, if they s hang out with kids who smoke dope, they're going to be junkies. You know, everybody thinks they're going to pick up what they see that's bad, but nobody ever considers that if you just treat a child with mercy and kindness, they will pick up those things too. So that would be my best advice for parents is to believe that they will pick up the good things just as easily. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much. I had such a fun time talking with all of you. This was really nice and I'm so honored that y'all asked me. Thank you. Well, that was our pleasure. Yeah. It was a wonderful conversation. You're, you're quite welcome and you're, you're welcome back anytime. So Dave, Andre, anything else before we close out? I don't have much else to say other than you You guys should buy Bitcoin if you can, even $20 <laughs> here and there, because it's not stopping. Uh, it's at 5700 right now, and it isn't stopping. So, um, As soon as I get uh, another $100 in the bank. All of the people are first, like, uh, I'm too late. Purchase. I'm too late to buy Bitcoin. That is a lie that you bought that someone sold you. It's never too late <laughs> unless you will die doing it. Okay. <laughs> Good, good. Well, I don't have anything to top that, but uh all right. Well, so once again, thank you guys for good conversation. Uh our Patreon is still up and running and there's there'll be another episode out uh next week. So thank you everybody who has continued to contribute to that and anybody thank you, else, thank you, thank you. anybody else, please consider doing so for only a dollar an episode. And at this the rate we're going, I think four five at most a month so you're talking about four or five bucks a month if you want to listen to all the additional content you know please uh go c check it out and consider uh, donating we'd really appreciate it so this has been the seeds of liberty podcast all of our information can be found at solpodcast.org and we'll catch you next time peace peace in the middle east peace in uruguay but not paraguay <laughs> But not Paraguay. Fuck Para Uruguay.
caviar sound on a cat food budget? Creamy Radio Audio by the Freedom Fiends has great free tips so you can sound like a pro without spending like one. The most powerful form of human communication is one person speaking to another. But if people have to suffer through your sound, they'll change the channel and miss your message. Creamy Radio Audio will help you speak to the world with sound that will make people want to keep listening. Check out CreamyRadioAudio.com. That's CreamyRadioAudio.com. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. 